want to know that bacteria so that you don't get sued. Moments. Oh! <laughs> Waiting for you to yes. get it. Yes! Here we are. I'm Dr. Paul Dillon, and you are? Dr. Simon Moore. What are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to start with the ears. And then we're going to talk about some rapid recommendations, guideline updates on concussions. And there's another part to this as well. It was C. concussions and C C O P D. See what I did there? Daniela Tools, <laughs> part two. We're going to go into that. Let's start at the beginning where we always do. Cover critique. Could it be better than last month's? Oh, could it be worse than last month's? No, it couldn't be worse than last month's. <laughs> so here we are. It's actually, you know, it's a lovely spiral. It's like a conch cell. Conch cell. You're spiraling already. <laughs> Too many C words. We haven't even gotten into the meat of it. So I don't know which, which way we got to. It's like just, an optical just illusion. Spin it super fast. Whee! And it's supposed to represent the, um, just like a spiral continues on unbroken forever, so should patient care. Once, Once you're a patient's family doctor, you're their family doctor forever. It's fract. It's not fractured care. Fractal care. Fractal care. <laughs> fractal care. It keeps going and going and going. Well, I think maybe you're right earlier when you said it looks the most like an ear canal. Yeah. So maybe we should start there. At the clinically relevant articles in CFP Journal this month, we got otitis externa. Uh, and an approach to it. Six authors. Something wow. we see all the all the time. And this one this one even has a C A S L P O as one of the authors. It's amazing. So we got an audiologist helping out. Yeah. Uh, so we've got all sorts of details on uh, what do you need to know about otitis externa? You need to know the bugs, you need to know the diagnosis, you need to know how to manage them pharmacologically and non. Where should we begin? So I think we should start with the cerumen. The cerumen so this is interesting. This I didn't know. This is new. I didn't know. Cerumen is mildly acidic and produces lysosomes that inhibit microbial growth. So you've never tasted it? No, I haven't. <laughs> but I also now, my kids, when they're picking at their ears and looking at their earwax and spreading it on their hands or potentially in their mouth, I'm not as worried about it. Oh, fair enough. Because yeah. it's cleaning. It's got the lysosomes it's self -cleaning. in it. It's like a self-cleaning oven. I gotta say, like the amount of bodily fluids that I've ingested ever since children, you know, cough in your mouth, drool in your mouth, <laughs> sneeze in your mouth, like it's just, just unbelievable. You know what? That's probably the one thing that kids have that inhibits <laughs> microbacterial growth. Otherwise, they're just kids are like petri dishes. They're just like pus collection devices. <laughs> devices, yeah. As so, soon as one area of the kid child is like dry, <laughs> there's another area that's oozing something. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Got um, it could be their external ear. Yeah. And then we're worried about otitis externa. They got that weeping eardrum, pain. that weeping ear canal. Have, yeah. Parents so, coming in with pain. And, and where, where have they been? I always ask them, like, have you been swimming, you know, in fresh water? Have they been to the pool? Have they started doing swim lessons? So it's called swimmer's ear, colloquially. Mm -hmm. So there's a few different kinds of otitis externa. They got the acute and then the chronic. And then sometimes you look in the ear and it looks like there's uh, the white cotton candy. So have you actually seen this? Oh, like several times. Ear fuzz? Yes. Not like dad ear fuzz where the ears get hairy <laughs> on the outside, yeah, the but like ear. inner ear fuzz. Yeah, have you seen it? No. Oh, dude, like actually. it is one of these things that the first time you see it, you're like, that's not, I wonder, <gasps> it's a fungal ball. Oh, and they always okay. come back positive for aspergillus if you ever swab them or send them. Always. Yeah. That's a strong word to use. Yeah. 100% of my end of single digits probably. Single digits. But Amazing. Okay. And so... Other than that, if you're saying it's aspergillus, yeah. Gillis, they, they, at the CCFB what hospital, about the bugs? Yeah, they love the bugs. They love to ask about the bugs. So uh, usually it's going to be uh, the big one we need to know about. It's going to be pseudomonas. Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, and uh, you want to know that bacteria so that you don't get pseudomonas. Oh! <laughs> Waiting for you to yes! get it. Yes! Oh, that okay. was great. Um, well done. Now, the other one, you'll know if you have a large amount of people working for you. Should I say a large staff? That's good. A golden a staff. A golden staff. <laughs> staff or really staff stretching. Orient. Come on, help You're me stretching. out, man. No, no, you're Just on your reaching. own with that. Okay, but, th but that's great. So those are the two big bugs you need to know. And a fungus. Perfect for studying yeah. for the exam. Yeah. Sometimes, though, you do the swabs, you do the tests, and they got the red painful ear, and there's no bugs. 
We got to think about what are these other diagnoses that could be causing this. So you got your your oh, lupus. A, lupus. Always lupus. You went straight to a house diagnosis. Mm-hmm. But what else? Seborrheic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis. So think about like what caused it. If you're doing a history and they haven't been swimming, they haven't been exposed to increased humidity environments, maybe there's something else. Maybe it's chronic Q-tip use. Yeah. It could be uh, acne or as they like to call it, a- acne. <laughs> I just made that up. That's not. A, don't write that on your exams. <laughs> I was like, I have never heard of that <laughs> before. Knee. God, Simon, you're so intelligent. You haven't heard about back knee? All the teenagers oh, yeah. complain about back knee. Uh, that actually, yeah, that's that's something we talk about at the review course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So those are diagnoses that could predispose somebody to acute otitis externa. But I'll be honest, you sometimes you look in that ear, it's actually really hard to tell the difference between that and seborrhea. So. Okay. But so what are we going to do now? Got this patient. We've made the diagnosis. Painful ear. What are we going to do? Management. Pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic. Okay, so number one step is going to be get the drops in. So it's going to be topical therapy. Mm -hmm. In a certain number of cases, though, you've got to be thinking, what are the things that predispose this patient to perhaps getting into like malignant otitis? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that stuff can be scary because that's got only one way to spread, and that's in. These are folks who could end up with, you know, mastoiditis. They could end up with an osteomyelitis. They can end up with brain infections if we miss that. Brain infections. Brain infections. <laughs> brain infections. That's just a catch-all term. You have a brain mm, infection. Yeah. So that's why they call it malignant. Uh, usually that's going to be the older folks, immunocompromised. Nice. Diabetics. I, I've, I've had some patients. So I almost consider it like a, a diabetic ear mm-hmm. and like a diabetic foot. Yeah. So that's the way you got to think. It's this end stage, end of, end of your body. Mm-hmm. It's not an end organ. Mm-hmm. But uh, you got to think like, okay, could this get worse? So then you're considering antibiotic oral therapy. Mm-hmm. Now, the article does point out a lot of times we do overprescribe potentially in this area. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've heard about that. I have not heard about that. No. Ah, you didn't even get my joke. I've not heard about ah. that. It was too... Uh, too obvious. Too obvious for me. You just keep banging your own drum oh. there with your amazing jokes, ah. if you must. You're waxing poetically about Wa- me, aren't you? Waxing <laughs> <laughs> Let's move down the canal and get to the meat of the matter. Yeah. So management for these folks, the topical therapy is going to be first line. Um, and how do you even get the drops in? There's great recommendations there for making sure those drops get instilled properly. So I think often when you see a prescription, it'll say like two drops or four drops and trying to count the little drops in that tiny little container. So the article actually gives some great advice. It says get your patient to lie on the side. Fill the canal, which Mm -hmm. is much easier for a patient to understand. Mm -hmm. You could play around with the tragus, pull the ear, have someone else do it, and then sit there for five minutes. So five minutes, pull the ear, get the get the uh, antibiotics in there, plus minus steroids, Mm -hmm. depending on what your local practice patterns are, what your pharmacy has available. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes, though, I know people get really worried about you know the kid's got a tube in their ear, or they've got a maybe a tympanic membrane rupture. Can we still give a fluoroquinolone eardrop? Totally fine. They're not autotoxic like some of the older antibiotics that we used to use for this. So the quinolone drops are totally safe. And what about an oral toilet or a wick? A oral toilet, spelled A-U-R, A-U. like yeah. auditory toilet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A wick. Uh, why don't I, I, I wick Do you, you tell me often? more about that? Huh? I wick you tell me more about that. Oh. Uh, no. That's, a, that's the best worst dad joke? The best worst dad Is joke. Is there a really bad dad joke? It's a groaner. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to listen to you anymore. Oh, I wish I had bilateral otitis externa listening to some of your jokes. <laughs> so, so what do you do? <clears throat> so they talk about cellulose fibers. I've never seen that. Um, just using like a, a cotton wick, mm-hmm. get the patients to lay down, put that in, and then immediately once you get it in, and I feel like this would be quite painful. I think mm-hmm. I'd almost use a bit of lidocaine or something mm-hmm. first potentially, and that doesn't show up in there. Mm-hmm. And then put it in, add the antibiotics to the tip of the wick, and it should fill up, draw the antibiotics down, and then bring them back and reassess them. Yeah, get them back in 24 to 48 hours. See if you can see that eardrum at that time. If not, you're going to, what does it say, repeat the wick. Uh, definitely not something I've seen a lot in primary care. Um, no, it says if you can't see the TM, remove the wick and then continue the drops for a week. It's like a little birthday candle. What about yeah, ear candling? Yeah. Ear candling? I've never done that. No, it's Do a great way to burn people. Yeah. Oof. It causes burns. Uh, not okay. safe, not effective. Uh, you mentioned cotton. Are you actually advocating for cotton? Cotton swabs? Never. That's right, yeah. The ENT docs I work with say, don't put it in your ear if it's smaller than your elbow. Elbow. So I'd love to (laughs) actually see what people do. That's one of those Mm -hmm. tips people give you. The Q-tips. Q-tips. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Now, the thing is, 
Hepatitis externa, great. You give the antibiotics, should work fine. What if, you know, six weeks goes by, 12 weeks goes by, three months down the road, they're still having symptoms. What's the diagnosis now? Now we're getting into chronic otitis externa. So you got to think about, could there be something else funny going on? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to think about, ooh, acetonoid oil drips for itching. Yeah, those fluencinolone. Fluencinolone. Have you ever prescribed that? Yeah, we give the ear steroids all the time, the okay. ear lotions. I've seen clobetazole use as well. At that point, I'm thinking about referring to, mm. to ENT. Great. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's going to wrap it up. That's the... Uh, Had that's an the, earful, really. Oh, 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 Can, nice. Is there more? I think we should exit more? the external article. Oof. And move on to some rapid recommendations. So these are some guideline updates that have been compiled by one of our colleagues and things that we should know. Uh, this is part two of three. Yeah, so one more coming up this year. Exciting. So we talked in our last episode about cardiovascular, about some diabetic updates. But so this really falls into two, the two C's. So COPD, a couple of updates. We talked about this in the course, I think, fairly extensively. And then some new Ontario's living concussion guidelines. So I don't know if Ontario guidelines are applicable to British Columbia. Yeah, it's too far east. Maybe. Yeah. And like the weather, the, and time the, people, the people, the physicians. I'm from Ontario. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> I said. Like, yeah, there's the line. Yeah, exactly. So they've got a living concussion guideline there and some uh, great recommendations with zero evidence provided. Perfect. That's how I like to practice. <laughs> like, how is that even in the guideline? Well, consensus guideline, they're saying, look, uh, get active. That whole yeah. stepwise return, like laying in bed until your symptoms are gone. People are laying in bed for weeks. No, they say within a day or two, 24 to 48 hours, gradually increase intensity of your activity is tolerated as long as you're not prolonging your symptom exacerbation. Yeah, so get back, get back, get active. You can take a short break, 48 hours. You need to be getting back and doing some physical activity, getting back. Yeah, I think that's that's across Canada. Mm -hmm. We can take that from Ontario. Actually, I think it's in the Canadian guidelines already. <laughs> Um, now, what if those folks three months later are having cognitive fatigue? I love this one. I have not heard this before. Had you heard about this before? Not for the this article? indication, but it, hey, no. it's in the guidelines yeah. and level A evidence. Wow. Methyl vanadate. I like how it seems like the author doesn't even agree. And it says uh, healthcare providers are encouraged to appraise the recommendations further before incorporating them. Maybe they're referring to this one. So I, I don't know. Like I... I can think of a very specific patient where this may actually work, where mm -hmm. I would, it would almost give hope mm -hmm. potentially, but it might work. I don't know. I haven't tried it. It wasn't, you know, part of my armamentarium of like post concussive symptoms to throw in methylphenidate, but. That's right. Yeah. They're recommending methylphenidate as a treatment. Yeah. Five uh, milligrams once a day, maybe even twice a day yeah. and to give you better alert alertness, better processing speed, better attention and better working memory. So. Get it, a shot. it may it may help a patient or two. You never know. Yeah, and then definitely talk to your provider before discontinuing use. And then the other, the third recommendation about concussions: blue light therapy. Blue light therapy. Go to a rave <laughs> when you've got that uh, you know that nausea, <laughs> that pounding dizziness. concussion. Yeah. Boop, boop, yeah. boop, boop, boop. There you go. So go to a blue light therapy, uh, and they're talking specifically. Um, I think that really important to know that the nanometers of wavelength wouldn't you agree don't you think that oh, absolutely yeah 460 to 480 yeah. nanometers none of that 485 crap <laughs> too much too high. overdose on blue yeah. light <laughs> you see that mega show those guys yeah blue man group they blue all group? overdosed on blue light therapy it just changes it they turn it's it like into the smurfs it's like the people who eat <laughs> 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 too many carrots yeah 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 they guys are just depressed they strumpf cranked up their blue lights did you know that um, apparently, what does blue light do? It suppresses melatonin and increases alertness. So, sleepiness, fatigue, depression, gone if there's blue light. So, just watch DJM gone. videos over and over again. <laughs> Let's crank that blue light behind us to 480 nanometers. nanometers. There you are. That's a number to remember. COPD. Everyone gets what? Do they get, they get a short-acting beta agonist? And what? Uh, no, eh. that's old. No, old. That's old news. What is the new recommendation? Lama. Long, long acting. Lama or Laba. La 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 Sounds like a sheep is saying yeah, all like these things. Lama. There, that's a great way to remember it. Clearly Don't be sheepish. Much. Don't be sheepish. <laughs> Get your patients on long acting medications. Don't let them pull the wool over your eyes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just on a little here. <laughs> all right. The uh, sheep farmers guild has clearly been influencing <laughs> yeah, yeah, these yeah, guidelines. Yeah. I'd like to see the conflicts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they say, yeah, lab or llama for all patients with COPD. In fact, some of these folks who've got a high 
COPD assessment score, um, they're saying they should even be getting dual lambda lambda right off the bat. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Wow. No, okay. Well, if you think that's a lot, wait till wow. you hear the next okay, recommendation. Next, yeah, hold on, hold on. More drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Triple therapy. Triple therapy. Specifically triple therapy. So uh, they talk who should be getting triple therapy in COPD, those who are high risk of exacerbation. So those are your lama laba plus steroids. And this actually has the strong recommendation with high quality evidence. It's interesting though, because they don't talk specifically about the higher risk of that. I know there's some good tools for practice about the increased risk of pneumonia if you're just dumping steroids oh, in people's lungs. Chronically, it is sure. measured. Uh, but they specifically talk about how, you know, if the blood eosinophil count is high, Right. Yeah, then you consider, yeah, something nine or higher. Then those folks are going to do really uh, much better conditionally. The recommendation is <laughs> conditional. It's an amazing recommendation conditionally. Uh, if they got high eosinophils, <laughs> to give them steroids as well. Okay, there you go. That's a great little practice tip. So that's part two of Daniel O'Toole's. So we did COPD, we did concussions, get these patients back active, maybe methylphenidate. Great maybe. summary, Dr. Dylan. This has been Dad Joke Medicine, episode eight. Eight. You got one more coming up, I think, this year. Episode eight, I got to say, making me hungry. Why? Are you hungry or no? Because you already ate. Eight. Oh. <laughs> Wrap it up with a dad joke. DJM, that. we'll see you next month where the jokes, I promise, will be much worse. <laughs> Dr. Paul Dillon, see you next month. Dr. Simon Ward, take care.